Yes. So I'd like to welcome Nick Appleyard, who is the head of space solution at the ESCAP. Never pronounce it. Even um, today, he's going to talk to us about. Well, oh, awesome. Hi there. It's nice to see the Appleton Space Conference back. In fact, twice the size of what I remember because I think we have a lot of people watching on a, a live stream. So, um, <laughs> uh, yes, Exat. Uh, this is Exat. Uh, you will have seen it on the way in, those of you who are not on the live stream. Uh, the uh, European Centre for Space Applications and Telecommunications. Um, my part of that is the space applications piece, or as I prefer to talk about it, space solutions. So a solutions for customers' needs, as opposed to applications of space technology. It's better to look at it from that direction, in my mm. Um I've not been a space guy for my whole career. Um, <clears throat> relatively new entrant, come from other sectors. Um, and that gives you a different kind of perspective on things. I came into space, uh, what, uh, six years ago into ESA um, from uh, having worked in other sectors. Um, and you see a particular kind of dynamic in the industry and the, and the, and the way that uh, um, uh, manufacturing and product development is, is done in space, which was which was quite different from what I've been accustomed to elsewhere. Um, so I wanted to give you a little bit of uh, reflection on that, and um, uh, maybe uh, we can we can build some things about uh, what happens now, just about new space, but then even beyond new space. Nothing says future like beyond new, does it? So I went with beyond new. Um, to start with space, though. Um, so this is, if you will, the, the, the traditional way of doing space with, since, the, since the 50s and 60s. Um, everything is sitting on a foundation of science. Now, the um, great thing about space is the visuals and graphics. We've seen some great videos, some, some great imagery, uh, which comes from the space industry. I'm not a space guy. I'm going to give you clip art, uh, and we're going to build a presentation on, on the basis of this. Um, really nice to follow shortly after Tim Spiller's talk, actually, because to see some of the quantum technologies that I was working on when I was a working quantum mechanic with the with the nano spanners 25 years ago, to see some of those device technologies now finally getting their day. But that was 25 years ago, and this is kind of my theme for, for today. Um, because in order to take that uh, that science knowledge and expertise and get it into something which is which is uh, uh, a space solution. First, you have to package it up as technology. Um, and there's plenty of exhibitions out there. We've had plenty of talks uh, today about, about those processes of, of, of taking excellent science and, and getting it into component and system technologies, which ultimately uh, are going to become part of a space program. Um, my own, after working in the, uh, in, the, in the science field for a while, I, I found myself on the, the first of these in the, in the semiconductor technology area, this is where I was 20 years ago. I was working in um, semiconductor device manufacturing and, uh, and fabrication. So that's your next step on the journey. And then when you've got all your, your technologies together, um, then you get into the procurement and uh, design and manufacturing and build and test of your spacecraft. Uh, and eventually, you get that piece of technology into orbit. And everybody breathes a huge sigh of relief because it was a one-shot deal. You only had one launch to get this right. Um, and from that point forward, then, you can then be offering services back down. And uh, traditionally, in satellite technologies, you're working with maybe uh, communication technology, maybe it's an Earth observation technology, or maybe it's something around GNSS and position navigation timing. That whole process, end-to-end, -end, is more or less the same time scale as my career development from being a quantum mechanic 25 years ago. Right? That's how long it takes to get things up. Um, now, from uh, an investment point of view, that's a no-go. Nobody is going to put private money into something which is going to take that long before it's an operational service and they start to get the, the, the revenues flowing. So but what you do have in orbit then, is optimized. Anyone who's worked in an engineering field will know you can't have all three of these things at the same time. You have to make choices. The traditional approach of the space industry is you choose quality because you're only going to do that one launch and you cannot have a failure. You optimize everything from quality, which means you have sacrificed cost and you have sacrificed speed to get there. 
The problems with that, the suppliers have got everything on that one launch. All the risk is concentrated in one go. There is a lot of money concentrated on that launch pad in one go. That's a big financial risk. It's a big emotional risk for everybody involved. It also means by the time you get the thing up, the technology you're working on is already 10, 15 years old, which means you then put that side by side with technology which hasn't been through that space procurement supply chain issue, and you lose most of the battles against the technology which is fresh off the shelf, which has been deployed in the terrestrial environment. So there's a long history now of space technologies going up against ground technologies and losing the battles in the marketplace because the space technologies are not as recent, not as modern as the ground technologies. But space has won in certain environments um, so where space is the best answer and there's really no contest about that, space wins. Or where you are really investing for a public good benefit, um, something which governments traditionally are very good at doing. Um, investing for science, for example. A space wins very often in scientific <laughs> application areas because the private sector um, um, uh, pressures are not there and because uh, the, the, the competition isn't there. Space is the best answer. But the investors not so keen on these kind of ideas. So how could we make the whole thing more commercial? There has been a lot, but the reason I moved then into the space domain when I did is I could see it's tipping over. It's tipping over into becoming more like a commercial sector. And how did that happen? It happened by compressing that timeline. And that, in a very short form, that is what we're talking about when we talk about new space. We're talking about getting things into orbit much sooner after the technologies are developed. Um, maybe not 10, 15 years, maybe five years. And that we've done that by changing that balance, by optimizing not for quality only, but optimizing to bring the cost down and to make things faster. And yes, there are always trade-offs of that. It means you are taking more risk on quality. You have more chance of a failure. But when you get the thing up there, it just doesn't work for a variety of reasons. But that's okay, because it's a lot cheaper, and you did it a lot quicker, so you just make another one. And that, that mindset shift of new space has completely changed the way that customers view space and the way that investors view space. Um, because now, that kind of timeline you're talking about is the kind of timeline that a, that a venture capital investor can, can, can reach across. You can say, we're going to build this thing, we're going to launch it, we'll have a service up in three years, and you'll be getting revenue back. In five years, you'll be, you'll be getting your money back. Investors can put money into things like that. If it's 15 years, they just, you just, they're very thin on the ground, the investors who can take that kind of risk. Um, now, space solutions, I said, this is my responsibility in ESA. Space solutions is about taking that finished space capability, going through another system of, uh, of procurement and development and putting it in front of everybody who isn't space. Talking to these guys who might be in the maritime industry, might be in the agriculture industry, might be in the energy industry, healthcare, and saying, we've got something here which is useful to you in your industries. It can solve a problem that you have in telecommunication, in, uh, in, in data, in tracking your assets around, because these are the things that space is good at. So that's space solutions. And this is what I've spent my last six years or so concentrating on is, is the right-hand side of this, this chart, is, is, is taking those space assets, which were developed however far back, and making applications from them, um, which you can put into the hands of those guys. Um, we must not talk to them about space. You have to talk to them about the problems that they have and how you're going to offer a solution to it. If you start by saying, hey, we come here from the European Space Agency and let me talk to you about space, they hear astronauts, rockets, Mars. It's, it puts them in completely the wrong psychological space to, to, to be working on these things. Um, so, but we're working with existing space assets. My brief 
for the last few years has been not, not to develop technology, to take the technology from space and to put it into the hands of customers. It's still taking too long. We got a lot of brickbats, a lot of uh, reaction from the market saying, ah, oh, yeah, but it's, uh, you know, it takes a while, isn't it? It's kind of bureaucratic. You put us through all of these processes and um, it's too slow to get to market. When I went to started talking to the investors and saying, come on, invest in these downstream applications, it's like, too slow. So we had to do the same thing that's happened in new space and we had to shorten the timeline. We had to compress our procurement and our, and our applications and services development to the point where um, we could keep up with the speed of the digital industries um, who are putting products into the hands of, uh, of end use customers. So that's something we've been working on. It was a, say it's an easy win, you know, it's um, process change and organization change is never an easy win, but it was an obvious thing to do was to, to shorten things. And the, the way we achieved that is by not using the procurement systems, which were designed for building things over 15 years, <laughs> but to develop different procurement systems, um, different mechanisms for, for placing contracts and managing um, uh, projects. Um, very good, okay. So what can we do then to even speed this up better and get things even more modern, newer into the hands of those end use customers. Well, now that the space industry and the new space industry has sped up its delivery timeline, to the same kind of timeline that applications and services development go on, we can start the two things going in parallel with each other. You already know what your space asset is going to be delivered. It's only five years away or three years away. You already know what it's going to deliver while you are specifying its design. You know what it's what the, the service is going to offer, the capability it's going to offer is going to be. So at that point, you can already go and talk to the customers and say, by the time you are ready to become customers, this piece of technology will be available to you. So that's the approach we'll now be taking increasingly with ESA, is to say, okay, we now have our menu of new infrastructures that we're going to be supporting the industry to, to develop. We know when they are going to go to orbit. We know when they're going to be making services available. We will now go and talk to the people who are going to be users and customers of those and say, right, okay, let's start getting you ready as well. Let's start stimulating the market, making sure there's going to be a demand side at the point when the, when the space service goes by. Um, which is, uh, it's interesting because they're not used to having that conversation with, with us at all. Um, but they do have some history of having it, for example, with the telecom industry. So we can build on from that and we can go in in partnership with the telecom industry, with the data services industries uh, and, and use their access to customers, piggyback on that to get in there. Um, from an investment point of view as well, again, we've shortened that timeline again. We've cut it almost in half by doing this. We can now go back to all of the private investors and have a different conversation with them about return on investment and timelines for, um, for commercial returns. Um, so now we cut that 15, 20 year timeline right back to 10 years to seven years, maybe into five years. The technology then, which is going to be made available to these end use customers is only five years old, not 20 years old anymore. It's much more up to date. It's all the new stuff. And it's going to be much more competitive when held up against the other new stuff that's being offered through, through, through non-space channels. So it's actually going to be better space technology. It's going to be more competitive. And it's going to have a better opportunity to be, uh, um, to, to be of interest to those end users. Um, that was all quite abstract. Uh, let me give you just to finish off a few examples of the kind of things we're talking about over the next three, five years of, of our a program delivery. Um, take connected cars, very concrete example. Great market opportunity for, um, uh, for navigation technologies, great market opportunity for connectivity um, solutions, SATCOM solutions, also Earth observation situational awareness systems. So it's all very interesting to, to the operators of vehicles, particularly as those vehicles become more automated, more robotic. Uh, more self-driving, they need to be fed with data and they need to be maintain a connectivity all of the time. We can assure that with satellite capability. Trouble with 
self-driving cars and, and uh, cars where their uh, critical systems rely on connectivity is that they move around the landscape and sometimes they're connected, sometimes they're not connected. This is the opportunity for satellite, is we can say, this is how you maintain, make sure that you're always going to be connected with your vehicle. Right? So there, there's a great market for satellites in, uh, in connected vehicles here. Those of you who spend your time on Harwell campus will recognize the, the yellow shuttle bus. Um, it's driving around, it's part of an experiment. It's funded, it's funded by us as a, uh, an R&D experiment, as well as providing a service on the campus. Why? Because we're trying to establish this, this satellite connectivity to, um, to, to self-driving vehicles. Uh, and key partner in that is Aviva, because one of the things we've got to do before the, we can let these things go on public roads is to, is to make sure that they, could, they can work in the, in the real uh, environment that they have to operate. Yeah. One more example, uh, the energy uh, systems. Uh, again, you know, offshore maritime uh, uh, deployments, uh, uh, infrastructure, complicated infrastructures. Again, we can talk to the energy industry and say, this is what's coming towards you uh, a few years out. We are forming task, task groups out of uh, major players in each of these industries. Because of automotive, the 5G Automotive Association, it's great. It's got everybody from BMW to Deutsche Telekom to Apple, they're all around the table already. And we bring space in there. We've formed our own group around energy, the grid operators, the renewable operators, the, uh, the battery storage guys. We can talk to them about long-term roadmaps. One more, and to build on what what Dave was uh, talking about this morning. Um, we're going back to the moon. Uh, we are building infrastructure, which will enable us as we as we go back to the moon. One example, which is uh, which, which is under the uh, um, the um, the umbrella of ESA, is this the Moonlight project, which is a, which is the data infrastructure, which is going to connect from Earth to the moon. The part of that which is on my desk in terms of space solutions is, well, who's going to be at the other end of that infrastructure who are users paying customers for that who actually are going to want that data connection? And we have to look a few years out into the future to imagine what that lunar economy environment is going to look like. You know, who's going to be operating these, these diggers? You know, who's going to be growing the crops? Who's going to be um, constructing the, uh, the habitats? But we can start those guys moving now, knowing that the Artemis mission is proceeding, knowing that moonlight infrastructure construction is, is on its way, and knowing when those things are going to be available, we can start talking to future customer industries now and saying, get ready. Uh, we will guide you through this, and we'll guide you through this in stages, which will take you ultimately towards becoming uh, building the new lunar economy. So this is the kind of approach we're trying to take now, and it all really boils down to shortening the time scale, getting things in front of end users faster, paying end users faster, makes the whole thing more investable, and it makes uh, for happy customers. And I will stop at that point. My summary. Thank you. Yes, I think we have time for one question. Oh, there we are, right in front. Uh, I'm, I may regret asking this question. I'm Liz Quintana. I, I work at Ofcom, um, the telecom regulator. Um, so despite our best efforts, um, development of regulations, particularly good regulations at the international level, isn't quite operating at the timescales that you're, you're talking about. So I'm just wondering if, um, either based on your experience currently at ESA or, or in previous sectors, what how you wrap that into some of your models. So thank you. You might regret asking that question. <laughs> Imagine how I feel. Um, <laughs> um, yes, absolutely. Whenever you're trying to introduce anything new into uh, an operational environment, there is this, there are there, there are things which weren't anticipated when the regulatory environment was set up. We had this with drones. Um, can, is it safe to fly drones around? Nobody really knew how often they were going to drop out of the sky and what they might drop on top of. Right? Um, so when we did the first generation of, of trials around uh, remotely piloted autonomous systems, we did them at sea. And there, the regulatory constraints were, were, were quite liberal. We proved the principles there that you could operate drones um, safely. Then we started defining air corridors on land where you were permitted to, to operate. And then 
hopefully we'll get to, to a, an increasing liberalization where you just buy milk and milk. Um, we're going to have to do the same with, with, with some of these other um, um, regulatory environments. Um, another example, there's a lot of work going on at the moment with laser communication, ground to space laser communication. The issue with that is you have to fire communication la lasers, um, which track across the sky and keep track of the, the satellite if you're, if you're communicating to, to Leo. We'd love to set this up here. We're 50 miles from Heathrow. Is that okay? Well, we, we're going to have to go and talk to the CAA. We're going to have to go and clear that regulatory hurdle to, to, in order to open up these markets. So we have to be having these conversations with, with, the, uh, with, with the regulators, with Ofcom, in case of uh, Spectrum, thinking a few years ahead about what will we want to deploy and what will we want to deploy at scale, particularly on the ground, which is the regulatory environment. So yes, we need to be talking to customers early. We need to be talking to the regulators early in parallel with this as well, make sure that we don't then end up with a technology and some customers ready to go, and they're not allowed to. That would be unfortunate. So. Okay, thank you very much. I presume you're here for the rest of the time. I'm here. So people can punch you and ask you more questions. Please thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um,